We crossed over when we invented antibiotics, blood transfusions, triage and ambulances. And for the next three, the year of you know, limb preservation, year of you know, functional restoration and for aesthetic acceptance, I think plastic surgery has a great role to play. The, as far as the limb preservation is concerned, I think what really made a big change was the microsurgery because the marvel of modern surgery. What we plastic surgeons did, apart from other people who used the microscope is that, we learned the art of you know, suturing small blood vessels as small as one millimeter in diameter. And that opened up a lot of possibilities it opened up. Because if an amp thumb gets amputated, and the vessel in the thumb is only about you know, one millimeter. Previously they were going to the dustbin, now they could go back to the hand to And the technology also helped us. Here I am putting the needles in the side on the wall of my, our thumb. That's the normal needle and the last one that you find is the needle with which, you know, with which we operate. And that allows us to do these things. This is what now microsurgery has achieved. This is the right hand of a young boy who has lost his thumb. And the thumb has been put back. It is hard to realize you know, which is the thumb you know, which has been put back. And this doesn't happen only one finger. Suppose if a tragedy strikes in and then all the fingers have been lost. I think with the 17 hour operation now we are able to put back all the fingers. And that's the picture you know, five, five years later. He's back in the same job. But what India did <coughs> was that we pushed the boundaries. I think we pushed the boundaries and what people said is not possible, we extend the boundaries of reconstruction. So here is a lady who I think, by any sense of imagination, most of the time it will go for above elbow amputation. That's what it would have gone. But then what we did was we followed certain principles, we devised some technological processes and then we put back the hand and that's the lady who has got the hand back again. And you see, f four years later, this child, this lady comes to us after a marriage has the child. And if you see the left hand, what she, we reconstructed, she holds the knife or the, she holds the carrot or she holds the tomato. And if you could see, she could build a, she could lift up a hole, uh, a bag with, with which has got a full of no water. And more importantly, it's not that we rejoined only amputated parts, but then more important, I think this is what now we do in day in and day out, now plastic surgeons do. The plastic science had a great role in the management of crush injuries with fractures. As the science evolved, I think orthopedics evolved faster. That means when the, when the lorry or something runs over, it doesn't selectively run over only the bone or fracture the bone. In addition to that, a lot of soft tissue. We had a capacity to fix the fractures, put in a plate, put in a nail and all that. But how do we bridge the gap, bridge the gap in the soft tissues? That was the one, you know, which is leading for amputation, there's one you know, leading for infection. He's a, but this is the limb of a computer engineer who had his both the legs injured. And he also had a big bone gap. And then 18 months of follow-up, you know, we find you know, that he started walking. And then he resumed his normal activities. But then the height of our achievement, you know, what he said, what he said was he sent this and a, a note he said, but for you, this moment would not have been possible, sir. The but for plastic surgery, this is not a possible, and then uh, life goes on. This is happening, you know, day in and day out, you know, the plastic surgeons do. Whereas that's in the lo uh, lower limb, in the upper limb, you know, we still do not have a satisfactory process. I'm sure you know, all of you would have read so many stories of people you know, climbing the Mount Everest with uh, uh, process on both the legs. Uh, but then have you, have you ever shaken hands with a person who has got an artificial hand? Never. Still, you know, the process technology has not you know, come up to that level. So, saving the upper limb it becomes you know, much more important and reconstructive surgeons you know, play a role. That's the hand of a small girl. It's just the hand is attached only by a vessel and a nerve and then there's a big gap there. We have to build up the tissues, we have to build up the framework, we have to bridge up the gap and then we take it from the tissues from the back and then uh, there's a big gap to be filled. Almost like the film what you know, Sir Sarabhati told, the thing we put in, uh, take the leg from the fibula we take the bone from the leg and there she is. You just imagine what would have been there in the life of this young girl but for this series of surgery. I think it makes a world of difference to her and the family. Not only we bridge gaps, we also you know, functionally restore people. I think it's not that you now we just attach hands, they function. I think that's what you know. Here's a small child you know, who has got a road traffic accident. There's the extensive soft tissue in the arm, there's the bone fracture is there, the blood vessels are damaged, the nerves are damaged. 
And then what we do is that, no, we usually they come late in the night. Whenever we operate on these people, we see the larger picture in what we do. It takes eight hours to eight hours of surgery they do, we have to do. And they all come in unannounced. That's the most important thing. I think we have to be prepared 24-7, 365. But in the end, we all feel that this girl would be like any of her classmates. She'll play as before. Her marriage and her career prospects are you know, just as been unaffected. That's what we do. This is the same child you know, two years later. That means you know, she is bending her arms, she elbow, she is holding, she is going back to the school. Now she is about a you know, beautiful girl of you know, 17 years now. Is this in trauma reconstruction? It's not that in trauma we only is function, but then sometimes in you know, a microsurgery could be eased. Long hair is considered to be a sense of beauty for all women. I think many of them love it. But sometimes, you know, this hair, this long hair could be caught in a moving wheel or a giant, giant wheel. The whole scalp could be this. In just in a moment of this thing, it could happen. This whole thing, whole scalp could come up. Whilst. It might be just only a moment, but then it could change the life for forever. But then with microsurgery, we should be able to put back the same chair. But for a small line that you find at the place where we join is there and she gets her hair back and she has got a hair you know, on which you know, she can wear the flowers. And the same girl now coming back after 15, 17 years later, coming back with her wedding invitation. Just imagine what would have happened if we had not done this. I will show you a case now, where it is unfortunate victim and you know, where we are not able to do it because the scalp could not be retrieved. And that's the process they go. Just imagine what's the difference it makes from this to this. Nothing is to make a tremendous amount of difference in the lives of people. Now, the now to the question is that is it expensive? Is this the technology for our country? Is this is, is it worth the effort? The lot of research has shown that it is heavily tilted towards you know, limb salvage and ricochet microsurgery. It is you know, extremely worth it because we have found that in our hospital we have found that quality care is the best way to reduce the cost of care. I think economics is becoming a very important part of any healthcare delivery. I think what really makes important is that we need to avoid complications and it is the complications which increase the cost of care. If you are able to give good primary care, I think that's the best way to reduce the cost of care and it is the appropriate technology for our country. So what's the paradox of India? I think in a small research that we did, this is what we found. The need of India is huge. But then the availability of resources and availability of skilled manpower, there is a gap. But then, tragically, there is another gap, sir. I think the other gap is the gap between availability and utilization. But then if we have to fill up the gap between need and availability, that requires a lot of effort. It requires a lot of resources. It requires you know, building institutions, it requires capacity building. But then, the other gap between availability and utilization, I think that can be easily be bridged if you have got the will. That means it, that, that is got by communications, education, and optimum utilization of resources and recognition of the resources. I think that's where. When I became the president of the Asian Pacific Federation, I think we need to have a tagline we can. That thing, the tagline was providing quality care to the millions who are less privileged. Is it a pipe dream? It needn't have to be. I think it, it can easily be possible where we all now can, can make it. So it is easy to bridge the gap between availability and utilization if we take you know, a little bit of you know, effort and this thing. I think we have got you know, fantastic, so many schemes in the government. I think it's all possible. The only thing is that it requires the thing with reasonable amount of compensation we can do wonders. I think that's where you know, we really want your help, sir. I think that's the way. Because each of these surgeries you know, take about you know, seven to eight hours to do. But then it is these seven hours for the rest of the seven decades of their life. If you really find what we invest and what we gain, I think you know, it just it cannot be measured in numbers. I think that's what you know, we really need to do. I think that's where we have to we have to move forward. The next line, which I am taking it from the Tatas, I think he said, a great admirer of Tatas and good institutions. In one side you know, he said, the India she could be. I think the India, the India could be. I think that's where. So plastic and reconstructive surgery, sir, it requires your nurturing. I think it needs your effort and it needs your attention. Secondly, in trauma reconstructive surgery, many of our units in our country are could be counted among the world's best. I think that's very important. And plastic surgery as a specialty and the institutions which move the world forward, I think they need no nurturing. This is a famous thing you know, which I quote from Jamshir Tata. He said, 
There is one kind of charity common among us, which is certainly a good thing, though I do not think it is the best thing to do. It is that patchwork philanthropy which closes the rag, feeds the poor, and heals the sick and, and halls. I am far away from decrying the noble spirit which seeks to help a poor and suffering fellow human. This, you know, he told when he was trying to build the Indian Institute of Science, he said, India needs basic things, but then why are you trying to nurture an important thing? Then the answer to him which was, what advances the nation or community is not so much to prop up the weakest and the most helpless members as to lift up the best and the most gifted so as to make them the greatest service to the country. This I talk, this, this is considered as a constructive philanthropy. I think that this is, I think, high time that India is moving forward. I think this is what you know, we need to have in our policy. What we really love is that India has to become a superpower. But what really happens, what we are now, we are a great knowledge providers. There's knowledge is there, we, we fashion it and they give it back. But instead from, we have to move from a knowledge provider to a knowledge creator. I think that's where you know, we'll move forward. Only when that happens, I think India will become a, India will become a superpower. I am sure and it's possible because with the confidence that we have had in trauma care in Coimito, all of us now feel very proud to say that institutions get a lot of patients from down the world. But then we are proud to say that we get surgeons from all around the world. In the last 30 years, we have got 2,800 surgeons from 70 countries visiting us. I think that's quite possible in a country like India, we can do. So we need to, to make that jump, we need your help. Before it becomes too late, Please do help us, sir. And then if you take help us through a few steps, we'll jump in a few more steps. Thank you so much, sir. And then what we will aim together is that, as the Prime Minister often says, we need to provide quality of quality care to the millions who are less privileged. I think I'm sure now, together we can move we can do it. Thank you so much for the opportunity.